So I forgot to introduce myself earlier. <laughs> I'm, my name's Anna. I'm a research analyst in ID. I just graduated from my MPH from the School of Public Health at UofL. Uh, but yeah, so like Dr. Ramirez said, I'm going to talk, talk to you guys about diagnostic tests today. It's just an overview of the presentation. Um, I'm, we're going to go over the how to calculate the measures of diagnostic accuracy how to utilize this clinically, and how to um, interpret ROC curves and AUC like he was talking. So the first uh, example that we're going to lead through this presentation with is that researchers have developed a new test to detect C. diff uh, where dogs sniff the stool of samples. <laughs> so you want to know how good is your new test compared to the gold standard? Uh, so any new test is compared to the uh, golden stand the gold standard test to to calculate diagnostic accuracy statistics. <clears throat> so you want to bo run both of your tests on a set number of specimens. So you want to run the gold standard test on a set of specimens and your new test on a set of specimens as well. So you want to know what the gold standard for C diff detection is. There's several stool tests. Um, there's the enzyme immunoassay, the P PCR test, I won't go over all of them in detail with you, but you just pick which test you want to run it against. Uh, so after you run your test, you compile your results into a contingency table. Brian kind of touched on it. I'm going to go over it again. So you want to know, if you've ever taken a statistics class, the two by two con contingency table is pretty much what they beat into your brain. Um, it's composed of a positive, a negative, and a positive, and negative, uh, kind of in a two-by-two two arrangement, hence a two-by-two two table. Uh, you want to put your gold standard test results, if you can see on the top, you want to put your positive results with your negative results, and then the new test goes on the left side. So each cell represents a specific result. So... Your first cell right there, TP, stands for true positives. These, these are both tests that agree with each other. So the new test, actually, the patient's tested positive, and your gold standard test, the patient's tested positive. Your true negatives are when both tests agree on a negative test or negative result. So your false negatives are where, the, according to the gold standard test, the patient's tested positive, but the new test says negative. And then your false positives are the gold standard says negative and the true the new test says positive. However, you want to always believe your gold standard. Even if it's wrong, it's this is one of the limitations to diagnostic accuracy tests testing. Uh, you always want a lot of true results and very few false results. So you don't want a lot of false negatives and you don't want a lot of false positives. Uh, so if this is the case, the new test works just as well as the gold standard. If every cell was equal, then your, the new test was worked just as good. So say this is the data that we get after running the two tests on. So we get, we, we're running the test on the dog sniff test and then one of our stool tests. Sensitivity is the proportion of people who have the disease as measured by the gold standard that test positive on the new test. So I'm not going to go over this too much in detail. You guys have access to this on the, the, power, the printout. But your formula for calculating your sensitivity are the true positives divided by the true positives plus the false negatives times 100. So plugging these numbers into the equation, we get 83%. So how do you interpret this 83%? So sensitivity of 83% means of all patients with C. diff, 83% of them will test positive with your new test, and 17% will be false negatives. Specificity is the proportion of people without the disease measured by the gold standard test that actually test negative on the new test. So the formula here for specificity are your true negatives, over your true negatives plus your false positives times 100. So if we plug these numbers into our equation, we get a sensitivity of 36%. So 
Of the pa a specificity of 36% means that 36 of the patients without C. diff, 36% of them test negative based on the new test. So 64% of them will be false positives. So this leads into your positive predictive value and your negative predicted, predicted value. All four of these concepts are very important in diagnostic testing, but positive predicted value is the proportion of people who test positive with the new test of everyone that has tested positive. The uh, equation for calculating positive predicted value is a little bit differently. So you want to take your true positives and divide it by your true positives plus your false positives times 100. So using these numbers, we get a positive predicted value of 36%. So interpreting positive, the 36% positive predicted value of everyone who has tested positive with the new test, 36% of them actually have C. diff. Whereas you'll have 64% because you 100 minus 36%. 64% false positives. These are people who have tested positive but who actually don't have the disease. So your negative predicted value are, is the proportion of people that test negative with the new test of everyone that has tested negative. So everyone with the new test and the gold standard test. The formula here it is, it's the true negatives divided by the true negatives plus the false negatives times 100. Uh, and using this equation with the numbers that we have, we get a, a negative predicted value of 83%. So interpreting this, you'd say of everyone who had tested negative with the new test, 83% of them will not have C. diff. So you only have 100 minus 83. Uh, you only have a false positive. It should be 17%. We'll have a false negative. So people who have tested negative who don't have the disease. So you kind of want to know, okay, so now you have all these numbers. You want to know how to interpret them. How do you interpret them when you actually have patients and in a clinical setting? So your false positives and false negatives are critically important. No test is perfect. You might detect some, you know, false negatives and false positives. Uh, so false positives, they can lean to unnecessary treatment. So if you have someone who's tested positive who actually doesn't have the disease, you might, you know, be given the medication that they don't need, treatment, therapy that they really don't need. They could be, you know, suffering from side effects from this. There's also social stigma associated with some diseases um, and outbreak investigations and unnecessary interventions. False negatives are also important because if someone is testing negative for disease that they actually do indeed have, this causes, you know, they might transmit the disease unknowingly delay treatment initiation and then they which might lead to poor outcomes so which one you know, evaluating the importance of you know weighing your false positives and your false negatives it kind of depends on the situation and what disease we're dealing with uh, so the last concept is the ROC curves and the AUCs that Dr. Ramirez was talking about so when you have a, a test that instead of having a yes, no, a person does have a disease or a person doesn't have a disease, it has continuous data. So, you know, it could be like the pneumonia severity index. The higher your score, the more at risk you are. Um, here are a few different tests that have continuous data. I won't go through each and every one of them. Um, but pretty much when you have a test that has continuous data, you want to know what cutoff point uh, of values is that gives us the best sensitivity and specificity for that test. So an example would be what level of the pneumonia severity index is best to use as a cutoff to predict mortality in a pneumonia patient. So this is what a ROC curve looks like. The y-axis is your sensitivity and your x-axis is your 100 minus your specificity. So it'd be your false, po false negative rate or false positive rate. I'm sorry. And I'll go over that vertical or that 45 degree angle line in just a second. So how you'd interpret your ROC curves, it kind of depends on your situation and what, you're, what, what disease you're dealing with in the test as well. So for this example, at a 90% sensitivity, you can expect a 55% false positive. So that's when you as a clinician, you kind of have to decide, you kind of 
trade what's your trade off what are you willing to trade off for a good test um and so the area under curve the area under the curve tells us how good your test is you always want a test that gives you more area under the curve because this leads this is, means the test has a higher sensitivity and specificity but like i said no test is perfect so you as a clinician have to decide what your trade-off is and so the 45 degree angle that's under the curve is pretty much like a 50 50 guess it could be good could be bad it's kind of one of those you, just, you the situation will depend and you can compare several tests with ROC curves. So you can, you know, if you're not only measuring your new test or the gold standard, but you want to test, you know, four others. Here's an example where you, your, statist your statistician will do an analysis that will give you the ROC curve, and then you and your statistician will get together and be able to interpret the results from all your tests. But you can compare which test has the best ROC curve. You always want the test that has the more area under the curve, but you also, given the situation or the disease, you don't want a, a test that's going to give you a high false positive rate either. And so here's our researcher. She's back. She got published. She had a good test. 